really good. Church, let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for the privilege that you have provided for us this morning to be here, church, in the church house. We thank you for the fact that you are the sovereign God that we serve, and nothing transpires in our lives about which you are not totally aware. And so, we ask the attitude of gratitude. Thank you, Father, for all the grace, mercy, provisions, and blessings that you pour out on us, things that we neither earn nor do we deserve. We ask, Father, in word, thought, and deed, that this service, the gathering together this entire day, would be to your honor and to your glory. For all of this, Father, we ask in the powerful master's name of our Lord, our Savior, <coughs> and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together say, Amen. 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 Well, I want to thank everybody for being here this morning, but today is the last day of the month, and it is the first Sunday of Advent. And so, we know that Advent is the beginning of the Christmas season. And the word Advent in the Latin means coming. But this morning, and I apologize for the shortness of breath, but we'll get through that too by God's grace. Before we do anything else this morning, we're going to do the hanging of the greens, which is a traditional thing for us, and it sort of opens and begins the Christmas season. Uh, I want to, if I may, share a couple of things with you. Provided, uh, beginning this Sunday and all the way to Christmas, to Christmas Sunday, we're going to start a prayer vigil again. Our nation and our families are in dire needs. And so the body of Christ is also being assaulted and persecuted even as we speak. Now how does the prayer vigil work? You take, take, I emphasize that. Any 30 minute segment of your time, your day, whether it's three tens, two fifteens, or a continuous 30 minute period. And allocate that time for continuous and total prayer. Prayer and supplication. You can pray for anything that's on your heart, on your mind, inclusive of our families, the body of Christ, our church, etc. fill in the blanks but a 30 minute period of time that is concentrated prayer. And we'll do that from today, this Sunday, all the way to Christmas Sunday morning. I, uh, I'm extremely gratified that Christmas will be on Sunday morning. And so, having said all of that, may God bless us one and all. So, without further ado, uh, I want to thank everybody that uh, did all of the decorating and the cleaning and, and the everything as far as the church itself is concerned. Thank you. <coughs> I also want to thank all of you for keeping me in continuous thoughts and prayers. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that later on today. But uh, let's, let's open up service this morning with the hanging of the green. So if, if uh, Sue, if you're ready, if everybody has everything that we need. Uh, 
Especially in the times in which we find ourselves. And so, <clears throat> the Word of God is alive and powerful and it's sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a judge of thoughts and intentions of the heart. All scriptures God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God might be fully equipped unto all good works. Now, before we get into the Word this morning, let's, uh, let's take a few moments to gather our thoughts, to concentrate on where we are and who we are because of who and what He is. So let's bow for just a little while, shall we? Father, by your grace and your mercy and because of who and what you are, we have gathered the church in the church house. There's so much, Father, on our hearts and on our minds, and there's so much that is temporal that seeks to vie for our attention and to draw us completely away from that which is eternal. We have such a tendency to concentrate on the horizon to not understand and realize that we need to concentrate on the creator of the horizon. We have so much, Father, as we gather together to be grateful and thankful for the attitude of gratitude. <coughs> and now as we look into your inerrant word, we ask that God, the Holy Spirit, will open our hearts and our minds to the truth. The truth of not who and what we are, but the truth of who and what you are. We ask all of this, Father, in the powerful, matchless name of our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together say, Amen. 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 We are still studying, as it were, the resurrection. We are <clears throat> we are making preparations to look at what Christ did for us on the cross from an entirely different perspective. And that perspective is historically, logically, theologically, and biblically. And so this morning, we are, I want us to take <clears throat> just a few minutes, but I want us to open God's Word this morning to the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John. We, uh, we're going to just concentrate in the time that we have left on this 19th chapter of John. There are other scriptures that we will be looking at as we go through this. But for the, as I said for this time, the 19th chapter of John, and I want us to start at uh, verse 19. Let's start at the latter part of verse 25. John chapter 19, 
verse 25. <clears throat> Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to her, the mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. Why did he say this? Because in the ancient world, widows and orphans were supposed to be an integral part of the family. And Jesus on the cross knew that if he had left Mary on her own, that she would not <clears throat> basically survive. So, he says to her, woman, behold your son. And he was speaking of John. And then he says to John, behold your mother. And then the verse goes on to say, from that hour, the apostle took her into his household. So she was provided for. She became an integral part of John's family. And it was the responsibility of John to make sure that she was cared for and taken care of. Now, in verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing all the things already being accomplished to fulfill the scriptures, he said, I'm thirsty. In the Greek it says, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine and put it on a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, to tell us that. Finished. In the ancient world, the word to tell us die was stamped on the back of receipts. It meant paid in full. Paid in full. Christ Jesus going to the cross paid in full. The sacrificial price that enabled us as the body of Christ to be who we are here in the 21st century. So he said to tell us die. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he bowed his head and breathed his last. Verse 31. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies were not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. Asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. This was a tradition among the Romans. In order for the criminals or those who were crucified to die rapidly from shock and blood loss, they were smashed in kneecaps, which prevented the individual from raising his chest and breathing. And of course, in a state of shock from suddenly being his knees smashed, he died from shock and loss of blood. Now, it says the soldiers broke the legs of the man and then the other man who was crucified with him. But when he came to Jesus and they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Verse 34, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. 
blood and water. Another significant sound, a sign of death, physical death. We're dealing here with the physical death of the humanity of the Christ, not the deity. You can't kill the soul and the spirit. You cannot damage deity. But our Christ was the hypostatic union, 100% man, 100% Christ in one body. And we go on from there. <clears throat> Verse 35. This is John speaking. And he who has seen has testified. And he testifies is true. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth. So that you, we, also may believe. What is this? This is John's eyewitness account. This is John's eyewitness testimony of what transpired before his very eyes. Eyewitness testimony is one of the greatest, one of the greatest uh, allowances in the courtroom as far as evidence is concerned. Eyewitness testimony. And therefore, these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture. And then this is the scripture where it says, not a bone of him shall be broken, speaking of the Christ. And the bones were not broken. And then again another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Again, the Christ being pierced by the uh, soldier, Roman soldier with a spear. Verse 38. <coughs> After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one from fear of the Jews. Why was there fear of the Jews? Because Joseph and Nicodemus were members of the Sanhedrin. As far as the Sanhedrin was concerned, this Christ of ours was their greatest enemy. The objective here was to get rid of the Christ by whatever means. And anyone, anyone who decided, who was a member of the Sanhedrin, who thought that that was not correct, he was vilified. He was persecuted. And so it says that a secret one for fear of the Jews asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and he took away the body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture, and I want you to focus on this, a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. So what do we have? We have, first of all, two disciples, two pallbearers, Joseph and Nicodemus. The deed that they had done was first of all dangerous to them because of the fear of the Jews. It was also costly. Myrrh and aloes were expensive spices. And what are they going to do? They're going to prepare the body of Jesus to go into the tomb. Now because of the arid warm weather in Israel, Jerusalem at that time, the normal procedure is to bury the body within a span of 24 hours because of instant decay. Also, these spices were designed to hold off the, the decay as long as possible. Now, it was not the Jewish custom to embalm or mummify, but what they did with the myrrh and the aloes, and we'll see, they prepared the body for burial. 
Now, so we go on to verse, verse 40. And they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings. That's important. Hang on to that. We just read that the baby in the manger, the legs were wrapped in strips, swaddling cloths, linen cloths. Hang on to that. We'll get back to that as we go through this study because it's important. So, with the spices, as the burial custom of the Jews, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. So what were they doing? They were first washing the body. Then they would smear aloes and the aloe and the aloes over the body. And then a layer of the linen wrappings. And then another layer of the spices and another layer of the wrappings until the entire body was wrapped from head to toe. And then they placed what's called a face cloth over the face. And this is where we're going, in the garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had, been, had yet been laid. Now that's important also. According to Jewish customs, after so long a period of time when someone was buried, after a prolonged period of time, the remainder of that individual was removed from the tomb and someone else was buried in the tomb. So that's why it says, and remember, this tomb, this area belongs to Joseph of Arimathea. All of this is his property. Why is that important? Because scripture tells us that he will be buried among the wealthy or the rich. And he was. Because in order to be a part of the Sanhedrin, you had to be well, well educated and well healed, as it were. You had to be wealthy. <clears throat> so, we go on. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, I want to emphasize that also. The day of pre preparation, they were celebrating Passover, the feast. The feast of Passover was one of those mandatory feasts where anyone over the age of 12 years old and older had to be present at the feast. So, was Jesus there? He did not come to do anything else except to fulfill the will of the Father. And yes, he was there. And so, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there in the tomb. Now, it was customary that they did not be defiled. It was customary that the Jews, although they were speaking to Pilate against the Christ, they did not go into what was called the pavement. They did not want to be defiled. But what we were looking at was my violence. Their objective was to crucify and destroy the Christ. For one reason, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, was a threat to him and the reduction of their power, their human power. Now, why is this important? There are things going on in our world today that are simply where we are right now. We have the body of Christ that is being persecuted for one simple reason because of our relationship with Christ Jesus our Lord. We have a so-called regime that is about, well anyway, I'll just say useless and let it go with that. There's a total, total complete assault on what we know as the family. If you destroy a family, 
you destroy a marriage, and you will ultimately destroy a nation. And we know that from what we saw in Genesis, under the permission of under the permission of the Pharaoh and the watchful eye of Joseph, who was number two in Egypt. Joseph watched his father and his brothers go into Goshen. They went into Goshen as the 12 sons of Jacob. They came out some 400 years later as the 12 tribes of Israel. When you destroy a family, you ultimately destroy a marriage and you ultimately destroy a nation. Let's bow together, show. Father, we thank you for this time that you have provided for us this morning to look into your inerrant immutable word. We ask, Father, that this portion of your word would be a source of challenge and blessing, that you would continue to keep us continuously mindful. We are who and what we are because of who and what you are, not because of who and what we are. It doesn't matter what goes on in this world, anywhere, on any section of this planet. You are the sovereign God that we serve. Nothing transpires in our lives about which you are not totally aware. And that's why you are the sovereign God that we serve. And so we thank you, Father, for everything that has transpired thus far in our service. And we continue to ask that all of it, all of it as it continues, would be to your honor and to your glory. We ask all of this in the powerful, matchless name of our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together said, Amen. 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 <laughs> Father, we do thank you for the privilege that you have provided for us to return to you that which you have entrusted to us as stewards. All of it is yours, Father. All of it. And we are gratified and grateful to merely be the stewards. And so we return and ask that your will be done as far as everything that our gifts and our offerings, etc., would be for the furthering of the kingdom. We ask all of this in the powerful, matchless name of Christ Jesus our Lord, that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together say, Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Amen. And the altar is always open. Anybody who wants to go to the altar, anybody who wants to stop prayer, please feel free to do so.